everyone. Welcome to our discussion on ultra-processed foods for Harvard Chan. I'm excited to be here. My name is Larissa Zimbaroff. I'm an author and journalist. I have a book called Technically Food, Inside Silicon Valley's Mission to Change What We Eat. I'm here with uh, three esteemed professionals who know so much about ultra-processed foods and our food system. I'm going to let them introduce themselves, and we'll start with Jerry Mand. Hi, Larissa, and hi, everyone. Great to be here uh, today. I'm Jerry Mand. I'm CEO of Nourish Science, a, a nonprofit uh, seeking to ensure uh, health through uh, diet, and also an adjunct professor at uh, the Harvard Chan School of Public Health. But most of my career, I've served in a senior government positions at FDA and USDA. Let's hear from uh, Kevin Hall next at the NIH. Yeah, hi, I'm Kevin Hall. I'm a senior investigator at the National Institute of Diabetes, Digestive and Kidney Diseases in the Intramural Research Program of the National Institutes of Health. Thanks, and Josemir, let's hear from you. Hi, I'm Josemir Matei. I am the Donald and Sue Pritzker Associate Professor of Nutrition in the Department of Nutrition at Harvard Chan School of Public Health. Awesome, so we're just gonna jump right in, but uh, we're talking about ultra-processed foods, which surprising or not surprising, encompasses almost 60% of our calories in the American diet today, which is um, concerning. And that's why we're talking about it. And I think the best thing to find out first is like, what exactly is a UPF or that's the acronym ultra processed foods? What exactly are they? And is there a definition that can help us, you know, start from the same place? Kevin, tell us what they are and what, how they got this name. Sure. So um, ultra processed foods are one of the four categories of something called the NOVA classification system, which was a, a new way of looking at foods that is interestingly completely ignores the nutrient contents of foods, which nutrition science has traditionally focused on. And this uh, group out of Brazil led by Carlos Montero um, basically decided he was going to classify foods according to their extent and purpose of processing. So he's got four categories. One is sort of minimally processed or unprocessed foods, kind of fresh fruits and vegetables, poultry, eggs, that sort of thing. Uh, category two uh, is something called uh, processed culinary ingredients. The way I like to think of them are the things that you don't eat on their own. So sugar, um, salt, uh, butter, things that you are oils, the things that you add to category one foods to make uh, dishes, or what is actually called um, category three processed foods. So category one foods combined with category two foods to make processed foods. And then basically everything else um, is ultra processed foods, but it also does come with its own definition. Um, it's basically industrial formulations, uh, relatively inexpensive agricultural inputs, um, mostly devoid of whole foods at the end of this uh, series of extensive processes to refine those ingredients, make them into um, using additives uh, that are typically not used in, in home kitchens, things and processes that are not really available to people in their home kitchens to make the vast variety of products that we see mostly in boxes in the center of our supermarkets and, and whatnot. This is so helpful. Um, so I think what we should look into more is that initially you think ultra processed foods is like candy, chips, soda, um, you know, um, junk food, but there are surprising foods that are actually also ultra processed foods based on this Nova definition. And, you know, the example that I come up with is cauliflower crust pizza, which you think is healthy because it starts with cauliflower. And that might be the first ingredient, but there are like 15 to 20 other ingredients and they're all highly manufactured um, refined ingredients where it might be the protein or the whey or um, a gum or a gel or a, a starch, in fact. And so I wanted to go through each of you and have you give us an example of something that is we think is healthy, but is actually actually an ultra processed food. And Josemir, let's start with you. Um, sure. So that's an excellent question because when, when we started looking into UPFs in, in our studies and we started going through the different foods and the different ingredients, I, I have to thank my students and my postdocs for this. They came up with the list and there were things there that even surprised me um, that came up as, as uh, ultra processed. But things like um, cereals and breads, um, some of them, not all, but you even whole grain breads, um, um, but they're prepackaged. 
And I think that's speaking to what Kevin was mentioning, that it's what we put in there. Um, they have some nutrients, they return some nutrients, some B vitamins, but we also need to put some things in there for their stability in the shelf. They need to be in the supermarket for a certain period of time. So that makes them ultra processed. Um, and that was a surprising one. That was a surprising one. And the other one that is always surprising to me is ketchup. <laughs> that sometimes gets us a <laughs> tomato uh, and a vegetable, but it's actually a processed food. Um, so we have ketchup in there. Awesome. Uh, Jerry, what do you think are some surprising, at, at least one surprising uh, food product? Well, uh, Josie touched on this. You know, I think breads, the breads you get in grocery stores that are wrapped in a cellophane, whether they're whole grain or, or not, they seem like a, a wholesome, basic uh, food. But when you look at the ingredients, they're actually, I would describe them as very sophisticated emulsified foams in the case of many white breads that uh, literally just dissolve in your mouth when you eat them. And so people think that a, a bread, and it should be by the name, uh, uh, grains that are ground up and, and made into a bread. But the way that they're made today are very sophisticated products um, that lose all of the structure and other components that really result uh, could result in a healthy product. And you end up with one that really is a very highly refined grain that can make us sick. That's interesting. In my book, I talk about how wheat can be split apart and then they actually might put it back together, right, to make this bread, but the, we've lost so much of the integrity of the ingredient. The wheat is no longer wheat. Kevin, what do you think is a surprising food? Yeah, I mean, I, I, and this is something that I use in my own diet all the time is uh, these convenient sort of ready to heat me microwavable meals that look, you know, from the nutritional profile and even have like lots of whole grains and vegetables and legumes as part of their formulations. Um, most of those are classified as ultra processed foods. And I think we need to be careful too, that not all ultra processed foods are necessarily equally bad for you. Like I still consume these foods on a daily basis every day at work. And uh, I choose ones that I think are probably not so bad for me, but I don't think we really know whether or not they're bad until we understand the links between increased um, uh, increased intake of ultra processed foods and a whole host of deleterious health outcomes. I'm glad you're on the job then. <laughs> so when when processed foods were first marketed to the world or to the U.S., it was under the guise of getting us out of the kitchen, right? Giving us a break from uh, all that work. And what was once seen as a luxury has steadily taken over our diet. How do ultra processed foods affect our health over time? And what are some of the chronic conditions that are associated with ultra processed foods? Josemir, maybe you can start us. Sure. And, and I'm glad that Kevin started addressing the part that, you know, maybe not all UPFs are considered the same, um, because I think that's where the evidence started to point. So I can tell you that in general, when the UPFs started being classified, most of the evidence was starting to come with overall total UPFs. And the evidence there was pointing that, yes, indeed, higher consumption and higher intake of UPFs overall was associated with higher risk of eventually developing type 2 diabetes and more emerging evidence coming with cardiovascular disease, especially for coronary heart disease, not as much as stroke. And we have seen that as well in some of our studies that um, one of my um, graduate students is leading. Now, having said that, what we have not seen as much is studies that are doing uh, specific types and groups of UPFs. And I think this is where we're starting to see a little bit of that um, evidence that some UPFs might have higher risk of disease and chronic disease than others. A consistently consistent evidence for artificial and sugar sweetened beverages, for animal animal based products, specifically for processed meats, we see that with increased risk of diabetes and cardiovascular disease. For other things, especially what we were sort of saying that were surprising before, cereals yogurt and dairy based um, desserts like ice cream and some snacks, the evidence is a little bit more conflictive, sometimes even showing that they might be associated with lower risk of disease. <laughs> You're making this hard for us, uh, or the food companies are making this hard for us. So uh, Kevin, you've done some studies into weight gain and obesity uh, aligned with UPFs. Tell us about them. Yeah, so I, I was very skeptical of the idea at first. I was very much on the nutrition is uh, about nutrients 
and I've focused on carbohydrates and fats and salt and that sort of thing on my research career. And so we designed a randomized control trial that would um, design two different diets that were matched for the salt, sugar, fat, fiber, um, carbs overall, glycemic load. And uh, we brought people into the NIH Clinical Center and they spent a month with us, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And in random order, they were exposed either to two weeks of a diet very high in ultra-processed food or a diet that had basically no ultra-processed, actually no ultra-processed food and mostly minimally processed foods. And we gave them very simple instructions. Just eat as much or as little as you want. You're not involved in a weight loss study or a weight gain study. Uh, just eat to the same level of you know, appetite, hunger, fullness, satisfaction, that sort of thing. And they did exactly that, um, but in, despite our diets being matched for these various nutrients of concern, uh, what we found was that people consuming the ultra-processed foods ate about 500 calories per day more over the two weeks that they were on that diet as compared to the minimally processed diet. They gained weight and gained body fat, and when they were on the minimally processed diet, they spontaneously lost weight and lost body fat. And so uh, we still don't know the mechanism of, the, of that. We have some a whole bunch of ideas about what the mechanism might be, but the diets were matched for the nutrients of concern. And uh, so we really need to kind of understand now, what is it about a diet that's high in ultra processed foods that causes people to consume excess calories, gain weight, gain body fat, and presumably over longer periods of time, potentially develop obesity and a variety of downstream metabolic consequences. Uh, so quick question, follow up. Did they prefer the UPF diet or the non-UPF diet? Was was there like a, did one come out ahead? Yeah, so we asked people to rate the palatability of the diets, asked specifically how pleasant was it to, to eat different meals on those different diets. And perhaps surprisingly, people rated the meals equally pleasant. <laughs> um, so at least in terms of the how much they reported liking the meals, um, there wasn't a significant difference, which is kind of good news. It means that perhaps you could actually reformulate or repackage uh, these ultra-processed diets in a way that would not drive people to over-consume, and yet they still wouldn't report uh, liking them any less. So we sort of view that as a positive. But of course, it then raises the question, well, what was the mechanism? If uh, An easy mechanism would be, well, I really hated the minimally processed diet. That's why I ate less of it. But that didn't mm. seem to be the case. That's great. That's so helpful. Um, so, you know, in the same same kind of topic, we all seem to say we're on a diet. Over half of Americans say they're on a diet, and many diets encourage calorie counting. But we're discovering that not calories, all calories are not equal, which um, you know makes it hard. I have type one diabetes, and I I know this because I have to watch my carbohydrates, and I have to. I get to see what fruits do to me versus a carbohydrates in a in a chip uh, or or in a cereal. They're very different, even if they were the same 15 grams of carbs. So um, for someone trying to navigate their health, and um, is it more important to focus on calorie count or nutrients or ingredients? Like, do we read the back of the the label? Um, what advice can we share with the audience um, as we dig into this UPF topic? Um, Jerry, what do you think? Well, this is why Kevin's study is so intriguing because nutritionists traditionally, and I'm a part of that uh, group, we focused on nutrients. Uh, we focused on calories. And Kevin, as part of our, our team, you know, he, he felt the same way. And as he just mentioned, he set out to do a study to show that ultra processing isn't the problem. It's the salt, the sugar, the fat, the nutrients that we've tended to focus on and the calories. And his study showed that that's just not the case, that the ultra processing is causing us to eat more, quite a bit more. And what's stunning about his number 500, it, it's a large number, but also our health as a country has changed so much. In 1990s, uh, not that long ago, um, there wasn't a single state in America that had an obesity rate of 15%. Uh, today, there's not a single state with less than 25 and almost half have more than 35. And overall, as a country, we're more than 40% heading to 50. That's so important because of how sick it makes us. And I'll 
bring it down to one simple thing. Americans have shorter and declining life expectancies than the other 20 top developed countries. We're dead last. And this problem began in the 1990s, accelerated pre-COVID, and it's continued to do that. And I think that's what's really important uh, for listeners to understand is just how sick we are. And again, we need, uh, Kevin's absolutely right also, that what we need is a lot more information. Uh, we need the studies. It's stunning to me that he did his study now several years ago, and it hasn't been repeated. The National Institutes of Health should repeat it immediately, and, and we should know exactly what it is about ultra-processed food so we can, as consumers, make better choices, but also so the government can help in the regulation of these foods. Wow. Um, and as you said, it's we've been declining since the 90s, Jerry. Is it is it speeding up? Is it getting more rapid? Well, you know, COVID makes it hard because it got a lot worse. But again, there, there was a, a link as well. So, you know, we now know that two thirds of uh, uh, severe COVID hospitalizations were really, it was COVID, but it's with obesity, hypertension, these di diabetes, these diet related disease, and maybe as many as 800,000 uh, deaths. So uh, COVID uh, accelerated matters, but we're seeing now the U.S. is slow to uh, recover compared to other countries as well. Uh, listeners, you know, th there's no question, I think, where there's agreement is Americans among the 20 leading countries in the world are the sickest. Wow, um, that's not great news for us, but luckily we have uh, smart researchers looking into things. Um, a recent study co-authored at Harvard Chan School found an increased risk for depression in consumers eating uh, nine or more servings of UPF in a day, which just sounds like crazy, but it's happening. Uh, and there are numerous studies connecting the dots as, as we've talked a little bit here between obesity and ultra processed foods. Why are these foods so hard to stop eating? Uh, Kevin, I want to start with you. Yeah, that, that, that is the, indeed one of the key questions that we're trying to address. So we actually have a follow-up study right now underway where people are spending another month of their life uh, living with us <laughs> at the National Institutes of Health Clinical Center, where we've reformulated ultra-processed uh, foods, uh, not the foods themselves, but the diets and, and chosen foods that match some different qualities. Uh, energy density being one, the proportion of so-called hyperpalatable foods being another, in an attempt to try to understand what are the drivers um, that cause people to overconsume calories on uh, diets that are high in ultra-processed foods. Those are only two potential mechanisms, the calories per gram of food, that's the energy density of food, and the, uh, the proportion of foods that have pairs of nutrients that cross certain thresholds, foods that are high in both sugar and fat, uh, salt and fat, and salt and carbohydrates. It's those pairs of thresholds that seem to uh, potentially drive increased motivation to consume excess calories at least um, in s some other studies. And so we're really trying to probe that now um, using four different diets to assess how much of a role those two factors contribute. Um, it could be that they don't contribute much at all. It could be that they explain everything from our past study, um, but there's a whole long list of other potential factors that could be driving this effect. And um, we're, we have limited resources at this time, but those are the, the top two that we're uh, focusing on right now. Wow, um, that's so interesting. These the pairs. Uh, are you are you leaning any certain way yet? Or are you still like I don't know? I, I mean, yeah, it's gonna. That one of the other things that's uh, a bit frustrating about this research is when you bring in people and you have to house them in a hospital ward essentially for a month of their life. Is we can only house, um, you know, two or three people at a time. Uh, and so it takes a very long time to get through these studies. So we don't anticipate having an answer for another year or so. Um, but, but if we had additional facilities, you know, maybe we could house more people and, and do this in a much more rapid way. But uh, given what we have, uh, we're doing our best. And that's a great, I'm glad you brought that up, um, the, the need that you have to house more people. Although I'm so curious what it might be like to live at the you NIH. Sign up, you can come live with us for a month and you can find out. <laughs> um, so I'm going to go to Josemir because I want you to connect um, uh, mental health and, you know, why, why we might be driven to um, eat too many UPFs. Right. And I think that Kevin addressed a little bit of that, you know, there's the palatability of these factors. There's also the content there, the sugar, the fats, the combination. But, um, and, and I think that a lot of the research has been starting to point about how consuming this might be associated with potentially increased um, depression and other mental conditions. But the way that 
we starting to see it is that the it can be the reverse and there's a two-way path here um and and that's what we have been starting to focus on is how we use these foods as an emotional regulation um and when we have stress when we have depression and when we have these conditions like these foods become our go-to precisely because of these attributes and these pleasurable attributes that we find in them and i think this is exactly why they're called comfort foods because we find comfort in them if you think about it i mean this is how Parents um, tell their children to stay quiet or they reward them for good grades. They give them candy or they take them to Dunkin' Donuts. I'm not calling on a particular place, but they just give them donuts or candy and that's a reward. Um, or you go through a break through a breakup or a hard time and you eat a pint of ice cream and that's what's really <laughs> satisfying <laughs> at that moment. So you really kind of seek that and but part of it is because of the physical properties, but there's also the emotional attachment. And the other thing that we have to consider is that most of these foods are consumed sometimes in a social context and we eat them with our families, we go out with friends, we go out to eat, and that actually is a pleasurable time it increases your serotonin and then you have this happy memory and you go back to these foods because it's comforting and again that's why they, we call them comfort foods um Josemir, do we know when the, the phrase comfort foods was adopted and do we know what like the historical comfort foods might have well, been we see sugar and salt and fat were invented with <laughs> in comfort foods um i don't know and now i want to know the history of comfort foods um but yeah it's it's comforting and i think it's comforting not for our body but they're comforting for our souls and for our well-being yeah thank you jerry why are food companies uh doing this why are they researching how to pair up these these comforting uh nutrients to you know uh, what we're seeing now of that effect? Well, the companies in the, in the U.S., particularly public traded companies, which most of the, all of the big food companies really are, their job is to make money, to increase uh, profits and to get uh, more growth. And, and unfortunately, the U.S. food system um, and, and most other countries as well, that growth is achieved through more calories. Um, and so if you look to the 1980s, for example, to today and say what's changed, that might be a, a cause. Um, many cite the number Kevin found in his study, 500 calories, possibly more a day, which is equal to about an extra meal a day of food. And so if you think about it, you know, food companies under pressure to, to get a growth that you want, it's not like buying, uh, getting more people to buy more cell phones or something else like that. You've got to get people to buy more calories. And, and, and of course, if people are going to buy it, they eat it. And we are getting a fourth meal day. So I think a big problem is just the incentive that companies have are around taste, cost, convenience to increase their profit. I think the key point, though, is the law already says our food can't make us sick. That's why the Food and Drug Administration and USDA's food safety programs were created so that food, particularly processed food, wouldn't make us sick. Yet they are making us sick today. The government already has the authority, but they're not regulating these foods. Is there, you know, I know that there's some need for UPFs to have a global definition, but is there some need to, like, what is being sick? Like, do we need some kind of, like, overarching definition? Is it one chronic condition, multiple? Um, you know, I know uh, obesity is a, a word that has a lot of um, charge to it that, you know, is that part of the problem? Well, no, I think we have great definition of, of what being sick is. And um, there are the diseases, chronic diseases in particular in this case. Um, we've talked about uh, them already today, a heart disease or cardiovascular uh, disease, cancer, uh, metabolic diseases such as diabetes, obesity itself is a, a disease. Um, I think, um, and, and of course, unfortunately, over half of Americans have one or more of these or um, and, and so including pre-diabetes. And, and so I think Americans, we know what it is to be sick. And we know, um, you know, we, we in a sense have a healthcare uh, system that is, you know, a food system that makes us sick. And then we go to the healthcare system to be treated. And so I think we know what it is to be sick. I, I think we need a food system 
and food that we can count on being able to eat, whether uh, certainly whether it's the, the tomato or the apple, but also the foods that Josie was describing, the comfort foods. The law requires that you should go to eat those every day. That's why the agency and not get sick. That's just not the case today. And, and Kevin and others are trying to do uh, the research um, to find out why. And so yeah. um, we're not investing to find out why companies are just behaving the way their incentives are aligned. And, and the result is uh, we, the people, are, are sick. Yes, yes. Um, so, right, over 50% of the U.S. population is uh, has at least one chronic condition. That's, um, last I checked, we were over 300 million. So um, that's a big number. Um, and one of the problems is that, you know, fresh food is not, um, it's not affordable. It's not tasty. It needs to be prepared. What are some ways to make fresh food more accessible and to make them um, something we want? Um yeah, the, so the population is 340,000 million people, so, sorry, 340 million people, um, which is um, really, that's a lot of people that have chronic conditions. What are some ways to make fresh foods more available and to make them more um, desirable? Josie, what do you think? Uh, that's a really good question. And, and I agree with Jerry that, you know, there's no need for the UPS foods to be the way they are. We can definitely reformulate and we can definitely make them better and, and make them more, make food that is healthy and palatable and affordable and accessible. Um, I will definitely let him speak to the policy initiatives around that, but I can tell you that one of the more community and potentially more policy also initiatives that we're starting to see come up is the food as medicine projects. And this is really seeing um, healthy foods as something that can help prevent disease um, through clinical programs. And there are various forms of this from prescription programs where you go to your physician and they literally prescribe you with a box or an amount of covered of, um, healthy meals to boxes of curated healthy meals for a condition that you may have or just for general prevention. And those are starting to become more popular. These are also sometimes covered by health insurances. I think that the evidence is starting to come up um, and now we are starting to see that they are associated with increased um, diet quality and people consuming better quality with some markers of this improvement of markers of disease. We have to see longer studies. We don't have sufficiently longer studies. And I think this is where the interest is starting to become um, generated. Um, but I think the important thing here is that if these programs are going to be um, delivered and are going to be spread out, that they have to be delivered equitably. Um, that, you know, we have populations that might not have access or might be targeted for consuming these UPFs at a higher rate um, because of marketing. And we want to make sure that they have access to these programs um, equitably and not only address the nutritional needs, but also the structural barriers that they may have, as well as their cultural preferences. Oh, I, I agree so much with you. I volunteer at a food pantry and we have uh, donations that come from markets that are completely, you know, unacceptable from, or just, you know, we have junk food that comes in and then we have fresh foods that come in and the, I see what people gravitate towards. Um, and I would much prefer to see just fresh foods coming in. Um, Jerry, are we worried at all that like writing a prescription for, for fresh food, it takes the, it takes the weight off of big food and reformulating. And what, what do we do to make, you know, foods more, these, these whole foods more um, accessible? Yeah, I mean, food is medicine is a, a nice thing to be able to offer people, but food superpower is prevention, right? Is, is, is um, you know, to not get sick in the first place. And I think you're absolutely right that your question before about what people should do, people should be able to buy the foods they like. And as Josie was just noting as well, you know, they shouldn't make us sick. That That is the law. They, uh, a, a scientist from USDA more than 100, you know, 100 years ago, Harvey Wiley created FDA because he was worried that processed food made us sick. And the main purpose of the agency for its first decades of operation was to make sure that's not the case. Now it does drug approvals, vaccines, so many things, it's lost its way in terms of assuring the safety of our food. It does a good job making sure you don't get acutely ill with uh, an infection, uh, a salmonella, those types of things. It, it does a relatively uh, great job there, and those numbers have steadily declined over the years. Uh, but these chronic diseases have increased because 
The agency is not doing that. Food companies, they have to be given an incentive. As I said before, the marketplace only incentive is to sell more calories. The government is really the one that has to say, yes, you know, uh, make sure food tastes good, costs convenience, but you just have to do the test to assure that it's also something we can eat daily. We should create a food environment, you know, that people can feel comfortable eating the foods they like. And they, we can do that. We just need to say that that's a requirement. Great. Um, well, then this leads me to my next uh, topic and question, which is that there are other countries like Chile, Mexico, Peru, and Brazil that have instituted warning labels on the packaging on the front of pack that tells you it's high in sodium or it's high in sugar. And it's ways for people to quickly uh, identify what's not good. But what policy would that work here? And what policies do we think uh, are needed so that consumers can make healthier choices? Kevin, um, from a research side, what do you think, um, what's happening? Um, what are you seeing? Yeah, so I'm not going to speak to policies per se, but I think one of the things that's very different in the U.S. compared to many of the countries you just listed is that we're already awash in ultra-processed foods. It already makes up more than 50% of our food supply. Um, and so what we do about ultra-processed foods might be very different from a country that is not already experiencing uh, the vast majority of their food supply being ultra-processed. And so in the America, I think that you know, what we should really be thinking about is what are the mechanisms that link um, ultra processed foods to these increased risks for uh, these chronic diet related diseases. If we understood the mechanisms, then we could uh, then we could reformulate and re-engineer these foods so that they don't cause us to be sick. Um, you know, they, we also don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. There's a reason why these foods are popular, right? They're tasty. They're, they're inexpensive. They don't require a lot of skill or equipment or preparation time. Um, they're what a lot of families rely on just to kind of make ends meet and make their families happy at the end of the day. And so if we just really understood what it was about these foods that caused us to overconsume calories, that caused um, uh, these various different health, uh, bad health outcomes, then uh, we could basically try to understand you know, which foods are the real bad guys, which ones do we need regulations and policies to prevent, and which, uh, which foods that can be re-engineered in a way that can make them healthy for us. I would love to see some re-engineering, uh, some re-engineered foods. They're starting to make it out there. Jerry, you with your with all your vast experience in the FDA and with the US government in policy for food, what what can we do? Are we do we need to follow other countries in making us healthier? You know, at, at this point, as Kevin's noting, a number of countries, and as you noted, are way ahead of us in this area. Um, and why? Because the companies are so much more uh, powerful here or our political system um, provides them a, a lot more power in how they influence policy. But I think there are some simple steps we can take. We talked about it already. I'll say four. Uh, one is we need to invest more in, in the science so that we know what the answers are and know what we need uh, to do. Uh, Kevin's study is, is was so eye-opening, and, and yet we still don't have any more answers uh, to it, and it's several years old. We should have gotten those right away. You know, we were, when we when we think, of, when we when it's important to us, like COVID, we had a vaccine in a, a year. We, we, we need to really know what is it about our food that is making us so sick, so then we can tell companies. Companies don't want to make us sick, they just want to make more money. And if we can tell them what it is, and set guardrails around the design of the food so that they have to assure that it's both uh, delicious, uh, affordable, convenient, but also doesn't make us sick. They, I, they can do that. I, I know they can do that. We just need to provide the science. That's one. Two, you know, companies, again, they don't have the incentive to do it. And it's too hard of us as individual consumers to, to, to force them to do it. The government is there. Um, in this instance, um, government can't do anything. But certainly in this instance, it's why we created these agencies to make sure our food doesn't make us sick, both acutely and chronically. That's already the law. We're only enforcing the acute part. Third, we need to leverage all of our government programs. You know, a few years ago, uh, we set new standards for school meals, and we created the, the measure we use about following the dietary guidelines. It's called the Healthy Eating Index. 100 scores, you, you follow the guidelines perfectly, and less is less. School meals were the same as every uh, American's diet when we started this a few years back, and it was a 58 score, a failing score. And three years after we put in place the new standards, it was an 81, a, 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 a 
a very good score, uh, better than 90% of other uh, of, of Americans. Uh, we need to do it more than the school meals. We, we need to do it with the biggest lever we have in government, which is a program called SNAP or food stamps. Now, the government last year spent 150 billion with a B on that. And yet there are no rules at all about what people uh, can buy in terms of food. They have to buy food, but they can, uh, and, indeed we did a study when I was at USDA, the number one purchase food with SNAP is soft drinks. Um, how can that be? It, it, it makes us uh, uh, so sick. We, we, we need to do that. And so uh, we need to invest more in the science. We need to um, and make sure our regulatory agencies work. We need to uh, leverage the biggest programs we have, SNAP. And the fourth thing is the overall goal should be that in America, every child should reach age 18 at a healthy weight or good metabolic health. That should be the government's goal, right? That's something that we should look to all these programs. And not just today, the goal is often assure access to healthy foods, put it out there, give people information. People need to understand if they're um, sick because of their food. It is not their fault. It is the fault of the system we put them in. And, and it fails them in really two significant ways. One is that it's just so hard to find the food, right? You talk to people who, who are trying to change their diet and they and it, they say, you know, I got to change the foods I buy. I have to cook them. I have to do that. But they said, that's not the hardest part. The hardest thing you have to change is they realize they have to change their friends. That's just too much. But it is because the people around them are mad at them that they're trying to change the way they eat. Why is that? They're just trying to be healthy. It's because the advertising, the marketing, all of these things are done to, as a society, to create a situation where we sort of make it seem like it's your fault or um, that you're not doing well, when indeed it's the company's fault for um, uh, spending the, the billions they have to make us um, eat food that's designed to be overeaten. You know, I bet we all, uh, our friends glaze over a little bit when we start talking about food to them. <laughs> I know that uh, I can, I'm guilty of uh, preaching a little too much about what we eat being so important. Um, but in reference to your SNAP, the SNAP dollars, 150 billion being spent on SNAP dollars, but, but the top thing bought is soda. I know that there's some studies small with schools, uh, with, with, teaching hospitals that are from Instacart and they're used trying out preloaded carts uh, for their shopping with SNAP dollars. And I think that, that there's seeing some interesting um, results from that. And the COVID vaccine, I hadn't ever thought, you know, we were getting sick and dying from COVID and we had a vaccine in a year. Why aren't we thinking about chronic conditions in this same kind of urgency? Jerry? Well, um, I hate to teach this conclusion, but as I said, we have a food system. These are two of our biggest industries. We have a food system that makes us sick, and we have uh, health, which I'll call a sick care system that treats us. And unfortunately, you know, I, I think money is great. It's a great incentive for people. But right now, the way we've structured our society is, is a system where companies are rewarded the most financially by getting us to eat more calories. And that the result of that is that um, people are sick and that rewards the system we have, the sick care system. I, I, I hate yeah. to describe it that way because you know a lot of great people work in those worlds and that's not their intent, but that's the way it's working. And so we need to uh, change that so that uh, we have fewer sick people, you know, because it's great. I mean, we need treatment. We need a National Institutes of Health that comes up with these remarkable vaccines. The, the problem is, is that we don't have endless money to spend on all this. And there's a study that shows that we need to have fewer sick people. Then we could all, all everyone who would need the expensive cancer treatment, we could afford it for them if there just weren't so many people who needed it. Everyone needs to understand that, you know, for us to be able to to, to have the treatments we want, to be able to continue to gain access to them in the future as healthcare costs go up. We need fewer sick people. The one way, the best way we know how to do that is through our food. Yeah. So um, this brings me to like, we need some hope, okay? Because this is like such a hard, hard topic. And, you know, I kind of dreamed up this question because I wanted to know what you guys might want to do with this. What if you had unlimited funding? Uh, Kevin, I know you're always watching your budget. Josie, you, you are at Harvard, which sounds like you got lots of money, but you probably don't. Um, what would you do if you had an infinite amount of funding um, in order to change the nutrition outlook for the United States? And I'm going to start with Josie. Uh, first of all, Larissa, if you have 
in infinite amount of funding to give us, <laughs> you're going to be massively popular right now. Um, <laughs> wow, infinite amount of funding. So um, I have to say that um, this is obviously, as, as you can have gathered from everything that we are saying, this is a very complex situation. It involves many, many different aspects. Um, so I think it definitely needs some multifaceted solutions. We cannot fix it with just a policy or just a food as medicine program or just reformulation. I think it needs everything, to be honest with you. But you said infinite money, so we can do it. Um, but to me, every single strategy that we would do um, would entail at least three things. First of all, to if, if we're really targeting nutrition, nutrition for the U.S., that equity in access. Sometimes we forget that food security and food insecurity is still an issue in the US um, and especially in some groups having more of being more affected by it by uh, by food insecurity than others. So making sure that every person has food in their plates every single day. I mean food is a human it's a basic human right and we should have the dignity to making sure that everybody has that. That's number one. Second that that food provides the essential nutrients um, to prevent disease. And not only chronic diseases that we have talking about, but even infectious diseases, as Jerry was referring to very well, most of the, we saw that with the COVID pandemic and, and how this was all um, associated. And we have plenty of evidence for that. I think that there's no question at this point that we healthy eating and healthy diets can prevent that. And to me, the third one is that, you know, we should enjoy food um, is, is still part there's a huge social component to this and you know teaching people or not teaching people but just reminding people to enjoy food where it comes from having that respect to food and the process of it and that is really also raise awareness about the processing part of it and the social and nourishing parts of food and I think that every single strategy that we do policy programs education at the individual level should have these three things in mind Wonderful, um, big task on your plate. Okay, I, <laughs> I'm gonna get you that money. <laughs> um, Kevin, what would you do if you had unlimited funding? Tell me how many people you would throw into a hotel and test. <laughs> yeah, no, let's focus specifically on ultra processed foods. I mean, I think that we really do need to understand the mechanisms by which they're linked to chronic diet related diseases. You know, we have this mountain of epidemiological data now that links uh, diets high in ultra-processed foods with a wide variety of, of, of chronic diet-related diseases. And uh, we don't know which are the most problematic foods. We don't know the mechanisms by which they're causing these relationships if, there are, if they are indeed causal. And so what I think we need to do is we need to get people together to um, work together that don't normally work together. We don't normally have food technologists and scientists who are in charge of engineering these foods in the first place, working with nutrition and metabolism scientists to actually design diets where we can vary the formulations and the processes uh, that ultra processed foods are made in ways that could probe at mechanisms uh, by which they're related to um, surrogate outcomes, uh, surrogate mark biomarkers, uh, overeating and, and weight gain and body fat gain. Um, we need uh, better facilities to house multiple period people at a time so that we can answer these questions much more quickly than we can do in our metabolic ward studies where we can only uh, where, where we can only uh, study a few people at a time. Um, so I think that, you know, in combination, I think we could really get at answers to these questions in only a few years uh, with the right sort of funding and the right sort of facilities. Wonderful. Jerry, one, I need, I need just one solution that costs a lot of money that's going to do us a world of good. What is it? Well, an infinite money, I would end poverty in America and make sure everyone had enough food money to buy the food they um, would like to buy and, and the time to prepare it. But but the thing we could really do costs a lot less than that. Uh, for $3 billion, I don't need an infinite amount of money, but for $3 billion, the one quarter the cost of an aircraft carrier, I would use that money, $2 billion, to go into nutrition uh, science to fund the work that uh, uh, Kevin does, but also the work the Department of Agriculture does. That's a, a $2 billion increase. That would more than double the current spending. It's shocking. Uh, NIH budget's $50 billion, and less than 5% of that's on nutrition. 
Um, and then the other thing it would fund is the FDA in particular, but both the FDA and the USDA, uh, to regulate the chronic food illness. Uh, we spend a billion dollars at each of those agencies now um, preventing the acute illnesses, that, and we need to do that. We need to continue to lower those numbers. But we spend almost nothing. At FDA, it's 20, less than 20 million out of that one billion uh, budget. Um, a comparable problem we had a few years ago, tobacco, and, and there's a lot of lessons in success there. Um, it used to be 25% of uh, our high school students smoke. Today, it's less than uh, 2%. Today, almost 25% of our children are uh, obese, and, and, and we need to bring that uh, down, and um, you know, we need the, the, the systems uh, to do that. So, um, you know, this is such a difficult topic, right? We, we, you want people to walk into the grocery store and be able to shop without with, and like simply without like having to put so much effort into being healthy. What are, and you know, to try to make it real world, what are some suggestions that you have for people? Um, one change that people can make um, that they can take today. My suggestion to people when I talk, when people want to know how to be healthier is put something new in your basket every week. So you kind of always buy, we kind of tend to buy the same things. Kevin, you might always buy your you know, microwavable lunchtime meal, but there's probably a different solution that you could try. So it's just like our diets all need variety. If when people ask me if they should eat the Beyond Meat burger, which is ultra processed, so is impossible. I say, fine, have it, but then have other things, have it once a month or twice a month, you know, have greater variety in your diet and put more whole foods in your basket. So that's my suggestion. Um, Joe Samir, you have a, a nine-year-old and a 16-year-old, so you're navigating uh, some some teenagers and preteens, you know, what, are, what do you do? That's a great question. Um... Well, I think that your point on moderation is very, um, very well taken. And I think that is something that we were advocating in the past, especially in the dietary guidelines, and it has been a, a tenet of nutrition, and, and we should go back to it. I mean, uh, we obviously want to reformulate foods, we obviously don't want these foods in the food system, they still exist. Um, I, don't, I think that if people consume them, not to eat themselves about it um, and it, it's okay to enjoy them. I do let my kids um, eat donuts and cookies if they want to, but in moderation and I might sneak a bite as well. I have to say that I cannot give up my flavored coffee creamers and I drink a lot of coffee and that is an ultra processed food, but I should take myself this advice that I give to other people, which is swapping things. Um, that if you enjoy something, try swapping and an using an alternative that is a healthier option. So for example, um, if apple sauce is um, ultra processed food, get the apple and puree it and do it at home. If you like yogurts and the ones that you're buying have artificial sweeteners and you still like the yogurt, get the more like Greek style version and you can still do it. So I think you can definitely make those swaps and make healthier decisions. And I should apply that myself to the creamers. Yeah, those creamers are naughty. Uh, Kevin, what would, what would you suggest to people? Yeah, I mean, to be honest with you, I'm not in the business of giving people advice. <laughs> and so... Um, because I don't, I don't follow it myself. Like I said, I still do try to choose the what I think are probably the healthier versions of the ultra processed foods that I can't get away from without the convenience. I mean, that's the thing is that they're affordable and they're convenient and they're just so easy to kind of incorporate into your day to day life. And um, unless you're in a position of real privilege. In this environment where, again, almost 60% of the food environment is ultra-processed, avoiding ultra-processed food is, is extraordinarily difficult. Um, I don't know any people, uh, maybe you with your infinite funding, Larissa, know the people with their backyard garden and their personal chef who can uh, prepare all of those foods for them um, from scratch on a day-to-day -day basis. I don't know any of those people. Um, they might be out there. And if you have that sort of privilege and you enjoy cooking and you enjoy spending the time doing those things, you know, yeah, it's not going to be bad for you. Uh, go, go for it. But uh, for the rest of us, um, you know, I just really think that we need to use what knowledge we already have to choose what we think are probably the healthiest versions of the tasty, convenient, affordable um, uh, foods that that we can incorporate into our day-to-day -day life. Great. I know, Kevin, I know that you're like not a nutritionist, but I, but knowing that you study it, I bet you get this question a lot. 
Um, Jerry, what what would you tell people as advice? Well, an overall aspiration should be the government's my plate and making half the plate fruits and vegetables. So I think if people uh, tried harder to, to do that, I think that's moving in the right uh, direction and, and therefore eating less of other things that make up our uh, plate uh, now. But if I had to give people one specific thing, you know, less uh, sweetened beverages, specifically art uh, added sugars beverages, but really sweetened in general, whether they're sugar sweetened or artificially sweetened, try to drink as few, if none of those are possible, uh, except water, flavored water, anything you could uh, drink um, um, that's not sweetened, not sugar. That's a great point. Uh, I never touch soda, but um, sometimes I do drink diet soda and I bet we all have some kind of guilty pleasure in our diets. It, it's uh, the number one thing that's making us sick. If we could do one, as you say, just one thing, it's it's more complicated as we've been yeah. discussing in the past hour. Um, but if there was one thing, I would I would focus there. Um, if you could stop drinking uh, sugar sweetened beverages, do that. If you could stop drinking all sweetened beverages, um, you'd be um, your health will be better for it. Maybe is that what we should spend our billions on? Just getting sugared soda, sugared drinks out of the. It, it wouldn't diet. cost that much, but um, but <laughs> yes, we should spend some money on that, and and probably the simplest thing we can do there too. And actually, instead of spending money, we can get money, and and that's because we should tax them. And yeah. it's a simple step. It's been proven to work in the uh, U.S. with uh, tobacco. I mentioned the success we had. That came from a, a, a dollar plus a pack tax. If we uh, uh, put similar taxes on the uh, sugared beverages, uh, that would help. And it wouldn't cost money. We'd actually uh, make money. Wonderful. Um, tax the soda um, and so many other lessons that we talked about today and ideas um, and, you know, why we need to avoid ultra processed foods. This was a wonderful conversation. Uh, Jerry, Kevin, Josemir, wonderful. It was so great to be here today. Thank you so much um, for talking to us today. Thank you, Larissa. Thanks, everyone. Thanks.